So let's get started. Uh, and first, let me thank the organizers for um, kind invitation. Uh, well, this seminar series is a little bit uh, difficult for my Japanese time zone, but uh, quite often I watch it online afterwards. So I, I appreciate, really appreciate the efforts of organizers of uh, making the record available. Um, so this time I'm going to talk about uh, my work, uh, which I did in collaboration with uh, many people uh, who were at IPMU at some point. Uh, Mir Ashkin Kumar Mashu Dodo-san, Apiram Kidambi, and Jacob Rida. And, uh, and what I'm going to talk about uh, itself is mostly based on uh, this paper in the May. Uh, so this is the paper which is mostly relevant, especially the connection to Swamp Run. Uh, but this itself is based on some earlier papers which we wrote in uh, two years ago. And there is supposed to be paper which is coming out this week, somewhat related with what I'm going to discuss. Um, so uh, let's see. So what I'm going to discuss, oh, okay, let's get stuck. Uh, what I'm going to discuss, oh yeah, here it is, is uh, summarized in one slide is the issue of uh, ensemble averages and holography. Well, of course, there are a lot of discussion about ensemble averages these days, uh, but what I'm going to discuss is a little bit exotic theory of holography, uh, as I'm going to explain. And partly related with that, there is going to be a global symmetry in the box after ensemble average. So it's a symmetry after ensemble average, so I call it the emergent global symmetry. And, and, and then the question is to discuss, uh, th there seems to be some structures which is highly reminiscent to Swamp Brand, uh program. And uh, that's, uh, that's what I'm going to discuss. And in, in, in fact, most of the time I'm going to discuss just the ensemble average story, uh, but I have some com com comments regarding the connection to Swamp Brand ideas. And probably after in the discussion section, we can discuss further. There are a lot of experts on the swamp ground, so I'm very happy to hear any comments you might have. Um, and uh, I'm not going to today discuss uh, list too many references uh, for complete references preceding the paper, but at least I should say that there are two papers which was the initial inspiration for us, uh, which is listed here. And uh, they discussed the ensemble average of the Narayan theory. Uh, and discuss the connection to holography. And what they discuss is the standard Narayan series uh, associated with the D-dimensional toroidal compactifications, uh, which is based on the even cell dual lattice. And we started doing that by generalizing that to even, uh, but not self dual lattice. So it's general even lattice. Uh, so we call it a generalized Narayan theory. And this sounds like an innocuous generalization, but it seems that there are very rich stories which is present only for non safety or cases. And uh, in particular, for the discussion of emerging global symmetry, this is extremely, it is extremely crucial that we go to non safety or case. So what is the generalized Narayan theory? Well, uh, before describing the generalized case, let's recall the simplest case, which is the, the S1 Narayan theory. Um, so here we have the momentum lattice, uh, left movers and right movers, and, uh, and then there is a radius of this one, which looks like a modular. And there is a T-derived transformation sending R to one of R and, and, uh, and then leveled by mo momentum and winding, uh, leveled by two integers. Now, uh, out of this momentum lattice, there is a nice combination, which is left mover squared by right mover squared, uh, which is always an even integer. And that we call the quadratic form, even quadratic form, quadratic form, which defines the lattice. Um, and, uh, but there is also another combination, which is the Hamiltonian, if you take the sum, which depends on the radius. Uh, so if you look at this, you can actually start from the quadratic lattice itself. And then, so it's just a quadratic two set of integers given, given by integer, uh, even lattice. And then choose the decomposition into left movers and right movers. So there's the Q and the light is a PR squared minus PR squared. And there's one parameter family of that from which you can define the theory. And the generalized Narayan series is a straightforward generalization of that. So you start with the even quadratic form of general signature. Uh, so this is just a lattice, uh, so it, sorry, this is really a quadratic form, but then you write it in terms of left movers minus right mover. And there is not a unique way of doing that. So there is a moduli associated with how you choose the decomposition. And once you choose the decomposition, you can flip the sign and then define the Hamiltonian, which depends on the moduli. And, and the moduli space uh, is given by this, the standard Narayan moduli. And what's crucial for our purpose 
is that uh, uh, there is, uh, sorry, okay, I have to, okay. So there is this uh, T-duality group, uh, which is the discrete transformation preserving the quadratic form and the CFT moduli space is quotient by this. Now, um, let's see, uh, let's see, let's start again. Let's, oh yeah, here it is. Now, what I'm going to discuss is the torus partition function because I'm going to do ADS3 whose boundary is a torus. So the torus boundary condition, uh, sorry, there, there is a partition function torus is written in terms of the standard theta function associated with the quadratic form Q. So you write as the theta Q. And it's a sum of a lattice and uh, there's a quadratic form itself, but also Hamiltonian, which depends on the moduli. And the sum of a set of integers, uh, you, you can write it in the more standard form written in terms of the exponential of tau, where tau is the modulus of the torus. Um, so in, in my notation, tau is the modular space-time modulus, whereas this what I wrote as m, it's a point to the Narayan moduli. And these are like a CFT moduli. Uh, if you pick up the point, it specifies a series where tau is a geometric moduli. So these look sometimes look similar, but they play very different nodes in what follows. Now, once you have this theta function, it's actually more useful to consider a slightly generalized version of the theta function, uh, where the sum of the lattice, which is denoted by L, is shifted by alpha and uh, so you, instead of L, previously it was L, but it's shifted by L plus alpha. And alpha is an element of the dual lattice divided by the original lattice, which is called a discriminant. So this is in general a finite abelian group. And, and I have quotient by lambda because it's uh, L plus alpha, and then L, for L you sum over the lattice. So you, you can quotient that by lambda. So it's element of the discriminant group, lambda dual over lambda. So in, in the even self dual case, this lambda star of lambda is trivial, but I'm not considering the self dual case. So uh, there are non-trivial elements here. And I consider uh, uh, associate partition function shifted by alpha. And I introduced it a little bit top down, but these are useful for discussion of the modular transformation. For example, if you consider modular transformation with single alpha, then if you do the S transformation, then you're going to have the sum of a set of beta with a different value of beta. So even if you start with alpha equal to zero, if you do the modular transformation, you're going to generate the whole of such theta, theta beta, with a different value of beta, where beta runs over the whole discriminant. So it's a, this, this set of data functions, uh, theta function defines a, a set of uh, a basis of, uh, of some space where the modular group acts non-trivially. And uh, let's see, so, so this is a theta function itself and the torus partition function is simply uh, obtained by dividing this by a power yeta functions. So the, P and Qs are the signature of PQ, yes. Sorry, Masahito, can I ask a quick question? This, yes, yes. this theta of alpha you just, meant, you just defined is not modular invariant, right? Uh, okay, so these are, well, let's see, sorry, which one? Uh, they transform the C, the Z alpha, they transform into each other under modular transformation, right? Yes, yes, that's right. Yeah, in fact, there is a formula here, yes. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, yes. So it's not the partition function. Okay, fine, thanks. Yeah, yeah, that's right. So it's not the modular invariant, which is related to the fact that I'm not considering the uh, self dual case. So for the self dual case, well, so if you want to impose the modular invariance, well, of course the textbook says you should choose a self dual one. And then uh, in which case, the only choice of alpha is alpha equal to zero discriminant trivial and everything collapses to the point, And then this becomes an invariant modular invariant. And most of the interesting structure, like this coefficient, et cetera, goes away. And there are reasons for imposing the modular invariance in string theory, for example, uh, but here I'm not imposing the modular invariance. Um, and, and then uh, we have a set of functions transform non-trivially. So it's like a vector about with modular forms. And we have some interesting coefficients, which is sitting here. And uh, there is some beauty in this formula. Uh, in fact, uh, for example, if you look at the S transformation, it's essentially like a Fourier transformation, discrete version of the Fourier transformation. So you have originally alpha, and then you have another variable beta, and you have exponential pairing, and the sum of the beta. So this is really like a discrete Fourier transformation. And, and in fact, uh, this is known as the, uh, this is one of the canonical representation of the metaplectic group 
Um, so it's like a finite dimensional version of quantum mechanics. So this is the set of partition function. And uh, now what I'm going to do is to discuss the ensemble average of the theory. So I already introduced the theory as I'm described in an align type double coset moduli space. And I'm going to integrate this torus partition function over the moduli space. And uh, well, let's see, there is one subtlety. But first of all, uh, the moduli space, uh, it turns out that uh, partly because if you have a general state of alpha with a non-trivial value of alpha, these alphas are transformed by the elements of the uh, T-duality group in general. So you have to keep the, when you define the moduli space, you, you have to quotient not by the full uh, discrete transformation preserving the quadratic form, but, uh, but, uh, but the discrete transformation preserving both the quadratic form and this uh, label alpha. So you have to change the moduli space slightly depending on the value of alpha. But in any case, there is a nice moduli space over which you can integrate. And then uh, there is a canonical metric, so it's a double coset. So there is a canonical metric, and uh, uh, and, and they can define uh, the ensemble average and see what we get. So this is what I mean by ensemble average. Well, of course, this is an integral over the theory. So if you ask me like uh, five years ago, I would say that it doesn't make too much sense if we integrate over the theory, what we are doing, but nevertheless, people are getting involved these days and you can try to discuss that. So it's some sort of a coarse grain description. So, so and it, yes, yes. The, the moduli space is, if the lattice is, is Laurentian yeah. or it's of indefinite signature is typically non-compact. Uh, yes. Is the volume finite or infinite? Well, the volume, volume is, uh, well, volume itself is, uh, is a finite, yes. Um, uh, well, sorry, let's see. Uh, Even when the yeah, so is volume, yeah, yes, yes, the volume itself is uh, well. Okay, so I, I would say that uh, it's a. Uh, uh, let's see. Um, uh, yeah, let's see. Um, yeah, it's a double coset. Um, yeah. yeah. So okay, so the double coset like like uh, like this space. Yes. 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 That's right. And so uh, typically like homogeneous spaces, like for instance, an example, a very simple example of this with different quotients the one you have is like the upper half plane, right? Which has- mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yes, oh. yes. Yes, that's right. So for, for example, indeed it is, uh, that itself is non-trivial. Even in the S1 case, for example, there is this uh, radius, mm -hmm. which runs, off, runs away to infinity, yes. Yeah, that's right. That's so- right. But it's in general, yes. it diverges. So is, do you need to regularize that or- uh, well, let's see. Yeah, so let's see. Perhaps uh, I, I shouldn't have written one of a volume. But, uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, perhaps I should have written that one of a volume. So what happens is that the moduli space itself is is uh, it has is non compact. Just as even this S one example. So it runs up to infinity and then there, and uh, but the integrand uh, converges uh, if p and q are sufficiently large. In fact, if p plus q the signature. The sum of the signature is greater than four. Um, if you go to tau, if you send tau to infinity, the tau decays sufficiently fast. You're saying the the volume is non compact, but the volume is finite. Yeah, I was well, gonna say the, like the volume typically is finite unless I mean even if it's non compact, no, unless we are not. Uh, yeah, yeah, okay, <laughs> I see. It. Yeah, okay, so probably I misunderstood remember that. Uh, uh, yeah, I think it's volume is uh, okay. So there is a log. Uh, yeah, so, okay, so in fact, in this example, for example, in the S1 example, it's not uh, compact, right? So it, it's, it's not finite volume because it's, uh, yeah. if you go to R to infinity, dr over R, yes. and then, so it's a log divergence. Yes. So in the S1 example, it's actually dangerous, but if you go to this uh, moduli space where P plus Q, where the, so it's a signature P comma Q, and P, P plus Q is greater than four, things are convergence, both, both the integrand and the volume. So you need to impose the convergence condition. Okay, thanks. Yeah, and then basically because if you have S1, there is a one power of R, if you go to R, of course, infinity. But if you have a, go to higher dimensional space, there are more powers of uh, R coming out, making things better convergent. Yeah, thank you. Okay, sorry. sorry what do you, uh, I'm a bit confused. What do you mean by the volume of the modular space is finite? Uh, <laughs> well, if you do the, yes, if you do this uh, integral of this with the- 
No, you sorry, I'm talking about the volume yeah. of multiply space. Are you claiming the volume of multiply space is finite for p plus q large? Uh, yeah, I thought that was the case. Uh, uh, yeah, I thought that was the case. And I still think it is, it is. but uh, let's see. Um, well, at least what I'm absolutely sure is that this integrand itself is uh, well-defined. Because there's a set of function which decays very fast at infinity. Yes. All right, yeah. And uh, so you're assuming this um, uh, in the integrand, this m uh, is constant over, over the tq, right? Uh, M, M is the moduli. Right, all right. So so if you have, um, let's say, like one cycles or two cycles in MQ alpha, um, mm -hmm. in principle, should you be summing over those as well? Like, in, in other words, non-trivial maps from the one cycle or two cycle of the torus um, into the moduli space? I mean, from a 2D CFT, mm -hmm. you, I, that, that seems like a choice, but from the point of view of the bulk 3D turn Simons theory, which you might want to do later on, shouldn't you in principle sum over those classes as well? Um, cross of the torus winding along the modular space? Is that what you mean? Yeah, sure. Or, or, or just, just take like the, the non-trivial maps from the torus into the moduli space, um, homo homologically non-trivial maps. Um, in principle, should you, shouldn't you sum over those as well from like a 3D quantum gravity point of view? Uh, let's see. Uh, well, but let's see. So here, well, uh, well, let's see. Here, it's a it's a single body function as a uh, as a function of moduli. I would say. So. Yeah. Sure. Uh, yeah. You're restricting. Yeah. To the to the trivial map. Uh. From from t two. Like at each integrand value, you're restricting. Yes. Yes. Yeah, yeah. But. In yes. principle. Yeah. But it, but in principle, it seems like you, um. You should consider more general um, uh, classes, I guess. Um, I mean, from the two D, yeah, it might be a choice, but yeah. Yeah, let's see. Yeah, I mean, in fact, uh, well, that's really the question. So here, I'm just uh, involved. Yeah, but we are not with the holographic part yet. So we are just doing the ensemble average of the CFT moduli space, space of exactly marginal deformation. So I don't think there is any ambiguity. But now, when you come to the the gravity side. You can, it's what, what we're going to claim is that this essentially uh, is a classical solution together with the one loop fluctuation, which, which people believe is a one loop exact. And that's what we're going to reproduce. Uh, okay, but it, it, please ask that later. Yes, so then, uh, okay, so what is this formula? And it turns out this has a very nice uh, answer. Um, and it turns out that the Sansamba average is, uh, it's a nice modular form. Uh, so it depends both on tau and tau bar. So it's called a non holomorphic Eisenstein series. And uh, this has a nice uh, expression as a sum, uh, which is known as a Poincar sum. So it's a sum over two set of integer, which are co-prime. And uh, there's a C tau plus D, C tau bar plus D, with some coefficients sitting here. And this coefficient is written in a, some interesting number theoretic way um, as the some Gauss sum. So what happens so to your eta functions? I'm a bit confused. You're not you're doing ensemble average of conformity theta or just the theta functions? Well, let's see. So far, theta functions. Uh, but what does you that can, mean? Uh, yes, yes. But uh, you can, OK, so I didn't have, have the formula, but you can have the include the eta functions and do the ensemble okay. average, too. Then what and, happens to the conversion? Then? Yeah, so you, you have a similar formula, and you just that the factor, factor of tau uh, becomes different. So you can so you have theta plus t that can be accounted for by the power of the eta function. Uh, so you it's, you get you get something like a theta plus t is replaced by eta, and and that's because the eta function factor is independent of moduli. So you can, if you know the mod, uh, ensemble average of theta function, you can just put in the factor of the other function. Okay. Yes. Okay, so this is the expression. 
and uh, it's called the Poincare summit to crowds out for physics, in, uh, well, the gravity interpretation, as I'm going to discuss. Uh, but let's see. So, and, and in fact, this, this is a nice structure. So, this is the mass theorem. And in fact, some of the structures you can anticipate. For example, so I, I say that uh, I'm going to define the ensemble average on the left hand side. And the point is that on the left hand side, we already know the modular transformation of this object on the left hand side. And the modular, there was a modular transformation. And uh, here, I copied the same formula. Uh, but the modular transformation itself is independent of modular. The coefficient in the modular transformation, there is no modular dependence. So you can trivially integrate out, uh, sorry, integrate uh, this equation, modular transformation equation over the ensemble average and you get some transformation properties. So, which means that uh, when you discuss the ensemble average, the as far as the modular transformation is con concerned, there is no difference between before and after ensemble average. Um, so you can derive the modular transformation property of the, what is called the Eisenstein, Eisenstein series from this argument. And, and you can check that this combination has the required modular transformation. Okay, so that's that's how, how you obtain. So now there was a question of what, what is the holographic dual? And holographic dual is very exotic theory. So we not there is not a complete understanding yet, but at least a uh, tentative understanding is that uh, there is a, it's a simply a Chan Simon theory. And it's a copy of U1. So if it's signature P comma Q, you have a P plus Q copies of U1s, a variant Chan Simon theory with coefficient, uh, the level given by this Q. And uh, there is a, uh, there is a sum. Uh, so okay, so it's a so this Chan-Sumo series not itself yet the gravity. So, so, so it's defined for each individual geometry. Yes. Okay, can I quickly ask? Is this so? There's the usual correspondence between you know current algebras and Chern-Simons theories in one dimension more. This this looks like yes, yes, just that is is that yeah. So why we uh, use yeah. after averaging? It, it's also true before averaging. Uh, well, let's see. So the the the, the problem with horror. So okay. So before ensemble average, in fact, there is a related slide for that. So before ensemble average, um, so there is a moduli uh, parameter, right? So the CFT depends on the moduli, point in the right moduli, yes, which is a continuous parameter. And and in fact, there is no such parameter on the Chan Simon side because Chan Simon series is defined by the level, and that's it. And uh, and. Uh, so the statement is that uh, if you want to have a holographic, if you want to discuss holographic deal before ensemble average, uh, you need to incorporate a parameter. And then there is an interesting statement that uh, the holographic deal before ensemble average is a chan simon average chan simon series, which have a describing plus the Maxwell term. How, how do you? And, say yeah. So that, that for that you need to quantize this average max chan simon series. And, and there is a nice paper by uh, Rukov and Martinek and Strominger and others uh, where they quantize the theory and, and they do some of the similar thing, the standard thing and obtain the wave function there and obtain actually exactly this uh, Z0 Narayan theta function. The case yes. is to get the partition function right, you need to introduce a, a kinetic term, uh, is what you're saying. Yes, yes, that's right. Yes. Now, you might quickly object that the kinetic term doesn't uh, make a difference because it's a three dimensions. Yes. Which means that if you go to the IR, Chan Simon's term dominates yes. over the Maxwell term. So they go away, uh, which is more or less true. Except that the subtlety they point out is that uh, if you have the kinetic term, then you can um, you need you can take a linear combination to diagonalize, et cetera, but that affects the charge quantization condition if you go to the IR. So the Maxwell term goes away, but it remains in a subtle way. Uh, by how do you quantize the charges? You, 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 it, it gives you a choice of the of the lattice for you. Okay. Yes, that's right. Choice of the lattice. Yes. But, but someone could just say this is my charge lattice and be done with it, right? They wouldn't need the Maxwell term, right? Uh, yes, yes, that's right. So in a yeah. sense, you can say that uh, yes, you can say that you start with and the Chan-Simon and... theory, but with a non-trivial lattice, depending on the moduli. Yes, yes. Yeah. that's yeah. right. So the Maxwell Maxwell term is the one way to generate that in the D by R. Yeah. Thanks. But you can start with the IR directly, yes. Thank you. And and then that will generate a, a, a zigil, uh, this uh, the theta function before the ensemble average. And what's interesting in this example is after ensemble average, you again get the Chan Simon series. So, well, of course, in 3Ds, there are not too many interesting theories. 
So somehow you always get a chance time. So a priori, the theory before and after ensemble average can be completely different, I, I think. But in this particular example, somehow you always get a chance time theory with a little bit of difference. That's uh, what you find here in this peculiar example. Yes. Uh, okay. Yeah. Um, so that's uh, how, how the story works. And then let's see, I can, let's see, I can comment a little bit about, uh, okay, well, not too much, but uh, I need to speed up a little bit, but uh, I can comment a little bit. For, for example, once you understand the Chan Simon theory, so I was saying that uh, the duo is a Chan Simon theory, but once you understand that many of the formulas being counted beginning to make sense. And I can give you one example. So for, first of all, uh, there was a Eisenstein series and I, I somehow very technically induced this level alpha uh, as some as a gadget which is needed for the decomposition of the theta function, etc., which is a very technical ingredient. Uh, however, in other than Chan-Simon theory, we know what type of data needed to specify span the Hilbert space. So that's uh, simply uh, the, the data of the anion. So it's a Wilson line. So if you have a solid torus, you can insert the Wilson line inside it. And that and if you do the path integral, you get a different uh, element of the Hilbert space in the torus Hilbert space. And what is the level? Well, it's a, it's a charge that is divided by the gauge equivalence class. And in this Abelian case, it's simply the lambda star of a lambda, which is the discriminant, which I was talking about. So the bulk interpretation of this alpha label alpha is that it is a label for anions, anions going around. And, uh, and, and then uh, let's see, there was a formula previously, which appears in the modular transmission, this T matrix and S matrix, which I said is like a S matrix is like a discrete Fourier transmission. And this is a formula, it's a well-known formula in the Abelian uh, chance Simons, Abelian TQFT or Abelian anion. So it is known that in the Abelian anions, essentially the quadratic form together with the discriminant is enough to specify uh, Abelian uh, anions. And uh, the coefficient which appears here is the so-called topological spin. So it's a spin of the anions. And uh, this S, S matrix it turns out determined by the braiding, which can be written in this form in terms of the quadratic form. So what we are we are really finding the structure of uh, abelian anions uh, in the bulk. Uh, so that is what uh, we find. And, and then we can try to interpret uh, various ingredients. Um, now, okay, so let's, let's, let's now come to uh, uh, the issue of the global symmetries because that's how the contact with uh, swamp round comes in. So um, far you have no gravity in the story, correct? Well, let's see. Yeah, so let's see. So indeed the chan Simon series itself is defined for particular geometry, yes. Uh, but somehow we say that we are going to sum over different geometries. In, so sometimes Sorry, people say that this, you, a, you say you want to sum. What do you mean? If the theory comes with graviton or not? No. There, well, let's see. Uh, there's not. Uh, uh, well, um, yeah. So that, that's that's the uh, subtle part. And you might expect that you might need to include a graviton separately. Well, what does that uh, mean? Holography doesn't allow you yes, that Yeah, but, yes, but, but uh, yes, but the statement is you don't. Uh, people believe that you don't need to incorporate a graviton separately, and it's kind of contained here. And if you like the, the current, there is a Sugawara tensor, which you can write down, which is equal to graviton. So, um, so okay. I don't, see, I don't see Einstein action. I don't see anything in the book looking like gravity. I, I explain that. I yeah, don't yes, yes. So it's, that's why it was sometimes called the top exotic theory of gravity in the, in the book. So what the statement that if you study just a, not the gravity, but the standard gauge chan Simon theory, well, it, 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 for, there is it, a it, point because if you want to say there is no, there is no there in global symmetry, you might have a global symmetry in a day as nine to do with gravity and we're all set, there's no problem. But mm -hmm. if you're yes. trying to make statements about the theory of gravity, you better first establish there's gravity in the story. Yes, but well, let's see. Yeah, so it is uh, it is not uh, not at all Einsteinian gravity. And hence many of the statements about the sun brand doesn't directly apply. So in particular, and, you don't have irregular black holes in this story, which uh, which gives you the idea that global symmetries are not concerned. Uh, sir, sir, what, what is the question? Well, the naive argument that global symmetries cannot be there in the quantum theory of gravity, the regular Einstein theory of gravity, yes, yes. Is that black holes would violate it. So you, you're not going to convert Yes, 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 that, that's right, yes. 
So the standard argument doesn't apply. So it's a very exotic theory of gravity. That's why I said that there is there is not a complete understanding of what this theory is. So uh, and it's a very exotic theory of gravity. So it's like a well, chance there's, there's, couple there's of a, gravity. The problem I'm having is I see no hint of gravity in the story. Can you give us what's the hint of gravity in the story at all? Sorry, yeah, for, for example, well, okay, yeah, for example, there is uh, this, what you get after ensemble average is Eisenstein CDs, and it's a sum over this uh, integer CD. And and this one you can interpret as a sum over uh, SL to the black holes, or sum of the geometries. Uh, sorry, Tori, with um, SL to the transformation applied. So in the 3D gravity, we are supposed to sum over geometries compared with the boundary conditions. And then these are some of the geometries. And uh, the contribution from each of these Eisenstein series, you can interpret as a contribution from this geometry. So, so can, can I maybe say something? I, I, I think that yes. you know, this 2D CFT, so the holographic dual would be ADS3, which has no local gravity just because it's three-dimensional gravity. And yes, yes. To that, as Kumrun was saying, you cannot form black holes by by evaporation or by, by collapse of matter. Uh, you you can you, you can put black holes by hand. They can be there or not. And and then that's the question that you're saying. The analog of the in, in higher dimensional gravity, you would automatically have to sum over topologies because black holes are produced dynamically. Here in three dimensions, you have a choice. You may or may not, right? And, and I think that what you're trying to emphasize is that when you make the choice that you sum over topologies, which is closer, is, is a better analog to what you would do in higher dimensions, then it seems that kind of like global symmetry disappear. Is that is that the picture? Well, let's see. Yeah, well, okay. The, uh, uh, well, let's see. Uh, uh, well, no, let's see. Well, okay, I, I didn't have to discuss the global symmetry yet, but uh, um, right. So here, the, the geometry I'm talking about is a standard type of geometry. So it's a, it's a, Geometry, which is compatible with the boundary conditions, which you have to sum over, and and so the geometry wise, I'm not doing nothing strange. So it's just essentially the tor sorry torus, it's a SFTD transformations, and so it's the same as the typical ADS3 gravity. As I say, there is no dynamical degrees of freedom. So, um, uh, so what I mean by Braco is subtle, but uh, at least there is a VPG Braco which is contained in one of these geometries. And and it's a very different. But uh, let's see. So that's a there is a, some indication of gravity, but it's definitely not like a usual gravity. So the typical intuition as to uh, what can or cannot happen doesn't apply. And in particular, it turns out this theory in the bulk has a global symmetry. That's uh, yes, uh, yeah. Okay, so let, let me come to that. So uh, okay, if you're not satisfied, please ask. Uh, but uh, uh, and, and then. And, and that's easy to see because uh, the, I, I'm saying that the bulk duo is like abelian Charles Simons, uh, which you might think is just uh, old fashioned gauge theory, but it tempts me to think of it as a bulk theory. Uh, and then this one has a global symmetry, zero form, one form. And uh, I'm going to discuss the zero form symmetry, so called. And, and that's what the simple symmetry exchanging the anion. So there was this uh, level alpha representing the anions. And the zero form symmetry acts by, uh, at least the, the type of zero form symmetry I'm talking about, permutes these uh, anions with those with the same topological spin. Uh, so this was determined by the quadratic form. Yes, yeah, so there was a formula here. So uh, if, if, if uh, there are two anions with the same topological uh, topological spin, you cannot distinguish them. And you can con consider the permutations of anions. And, uh, and it turns out that this transformation, uh, well, of course, it is a symmetry of the theory after ensemble average, so it preserves uh, the Eisenstein series, the partition function after the ensemble average. But before ensemble average, uh, it's not the case. So it's not a symmetry after uh, before ensemble average. The set of function is not invariant, but it turns out that there is a, in some cases, when the symmetry originates from uh, t direct trans trans transformation, uh, it turns out that uh, if you simultaneously act, uh, let the group act on the both moduli and the anions, then uh, there is a symmetry. 
So, uh, but of course, it acts on the moduli, so it's not the symmetry of the single theory, but it's like a symmetry of the class of theories. And and then, uh, but this is a, a general lesson. And in, in some cases, for example, suppose that we are going to discuss, for whatever reason, want to discuss ensemble average over the moduli space. And there is a, well, I'm going to assume two things. The first is that there is a symmetry of the group action and then symmetry of the operators. Uh, and uh, operators in this sense, and also compatible with, uh, with the measure, and then you get the downside average is, is preserved. So originally it was also acting on the moduli, so it's a symmetry uh, relating different theories. But after the ensemble average, uh, you it becomes a global symmetry because there is the m disappears. And this seems to be what is happening here. So previously there, it, there was a symmetry which acts simultaneously on the anion level as well as the moduli. Uh, but uh, okay, so this is simple to show. But uh, yes, uh, but but not right now. After after the ensemble average, it becomes uh, is promoted to a global symmetry. So that, that's what we call the duality origami uh, because initially the symmetry acts on the ensemble as well, ensemble itself. So it's a symmetry of the ensemble. So if there's a moduli space, there's a symmetry compatible with the moduli space. Um, and the good example is the T-duality transformation. And then that was not the global symmetry because it, it connects different series. But when you do the ensemble average, these symmetries are kind of folded uh, to actual global symmetry. So that is technically, we realize is how you get the uh, apparent global symmetry after ensemble average. Now, okay, I'm, I'm really long, uh, yeah, I, 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 let me finish in a few minutes. Uh, but uh, of course, the question is, yeah, we want to have the discussion about what it implies for swamp round. And uh, as I said, I don't have a full answer. But uh, one answer, one, one thing is that uh, there, there is a connection uh, to, uh, uh, of, well, this is, I was bringing the T-duality. It looks like a symmetry on ensemble and that's promoted to emerge in global symmetry in this example. Uh, but now you might expect that there might be, there could be some connection to distance conjecture where uh, the global symmetry, apparent global symmetry emerges at the infinite distance point in the modular space. Could there be something similar here? And, uh, well, at least technically something similar happens. Um, so so this this is the one stripe which shows the, at least in some technical sense, very technical sense, there's a connection to infinite distance and the ensemble average. So here you start with a theta function, you do the ensemble average. And what I said is they obtain a sum over SL to Z black holes, the sum over geometries. And there is a coefficient, which is this gamma. Uh, but instead of do, going through this ensemble average, there is a different way of extracting this information, which is simply to go to the cost as tau goes to minus d over c. Um, and this is like an infinite distance in not in the CFT moduli space, but in the CFT moduli space, or, or let's sorry, in the, the space time moduli space. Um, so it's just the size of the torus, uh, the, uh, the boundary of the 3D geometry. Uh, goes to uh, is kind of shrinks in one of the directions, um, and, and if you do that, uh, you, you, this behavior here you can study using the modular transformation, and then you get uh, this length space, uh, this invariant, uh, this gamma. Um, so the behavior of the cusp, which you can think of as the infinite distance, uh, recovers the information of the ensemble average, at least technical sense. And uh, Hido, in the wait, sense, uh, yes. Yes, yeah, sorry to interrupt. Yes, before please. we were um, discussing the, that the holographic dual before or after averaging had mm -hmm. this kinetic term for the gates, like the mass well. Yes, yes, yes. Can, maybe you will say this, I'm not sure, but can you then understand that the from the holographic perspective, the ensemble where you get the global symmetry is the limit in which the gauge coupling is going to zero and restore the global symmetry. Uh, so you get rid of the mass. Well, let's see. Yeah. Uh, yeah, the gauge. maximum term is going to be eliminated. Um, but uh, you have to, so, uh, but depends on, uh, let's see. So because the maximum term is dominated by the chance sum of in infrared. Uh, 
Uh, but it, it, it remains in a subtle way as the quantization condition. That's what I said. Now, if, so we are doing the, in that picture, we are doing the ensemble average over that possible uh, space of um, kinetic terms. And, um, and what you get uh, afterwards is not necessarily uh, uh, any special particular point in, the, uh, in, the, in that moduli space, but rather a different answer. For example, here you have a theta function and you get uh, full Eisen instances, which is not like a theta function with a special point in the moduli. Uh, I hope you are, I'm answering what you were asking for. Uh, uh, please ask again. If, no, it's okay. a bit more later. Please go. Yeah, on. yeah. So, yeah. So there is a yes. Um, um, yeah, parameter here, and um, so it, it's it's we are doing from this bulk, bulk viewpoint. We are doing something very funny. So here on the left hand side, there is a modular space CFT. So it may it might feel you might feel a little bit better integrate over that. But here. In a sense, uh, you can say the Maxwell term or different choice of quantization conditions. So you have a theory and you integrate over the possible choices of quantization conditions. That's what you do in the bulk. This sounds bizarre, but at least that's what we are doing. And it, it is a bizarre operation in a sense, but you get a very nice answer. Okay, but then it's different than decoupling the dynamics by sending the gates coupling to zero is yes that you are summing yeah oh, okay yeah, yes, yes. It's, 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 it's it's different yes it's uh, some extra more more extra operation mm -hmm. okay uh okay so uh i guess i'm supposed to finish in 40 minutes right so i, I guess i'm already 50 minutes uh five minutes over time so uh let me try to finish so let's see at least uh the the comment is that uh, some of the structures, so ensemble, there seems to be, at least in this particular example, the connection between ensemble average and the infinite distance in the space time torus. Um, and so I, I wonder, well, of course, this doesn't guarantee that there is any connection in general, but I, I wonder there could be a way, in sense that in which uh, uh, Ensemble average at least captures part of the information in some of the infinite distance, distance direction. And uh, um, yeah, so uh, well, let's see. So one, one more comment I have is that uh, uh, well, you can try to also analyze somewhat systematically uh, the difference before and after ensemble average. And uh, and then there is at least a mathematical way of doing that. So this set of functions, the modular form with respect to some congruent subgroup. So it defined, it's defined on some quotient to the upper half frame. And, and then you can regard it as a wave function with respect to Laplacian, uh, with respect to the tau. And, uh, and then you can try to do the decomposition. So both of these functions, set of function, eigenstance is eigenfunction. And you can try to do the eigen, uh, eigen by the decompositions. And, 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 and then if you use that technique, then the deviations of the theta function from the ensemble average, which is Eisenstein series, can be expanded as here. Uh, there is some expansion. I'm not going to explain the notation, but there is some expansion. So these are eigenfunction Laplacian, et cetera. And, um, so, and then this co contribution from these coefficients uh, uh, represents the breaking of the emer emergent global symmetry uh, before ensemble average. So there is at least a way to mathematical framework to separate uh, down some average from the list and, and then try to quantify. So how, how much global symmetry there is depends on how large these coefficients are, for example. Uh, okay, yeah, then, then I literally finished, but uh, one more comment is that you can also try to, once you have the global, global symmetry, you can also try to gauge the global symmetry. And uh, that's uh, the paper to appear this week. And it turns out the short answer is that you try to gauge the global symmetry in the bulk uh, that's translated into the OB folding, the CFT. Um, and then you get the sum of uh, twisted sectors and non-twisted sectors. Um, and uh, that's the, what you find in the CFT partition function. Um, okay, so I'm not out of time. So, so what I discussed is um, some, some particular example. It's a exotic theory indeed. It's not Einsteinian theory. Um, so in fact, some people got discouraged by that. 
Uh, but the good thing is that it, you can discuss things, everything very precisely. There are all these great formulas and they're interesting number theory structures. And, and in this example, there are global symmetries, which is emergent. And sometimes it, it arises from essentially from T-duality uh, before uh, ensemble average. And I commented on just uh, one or two small hints where these things resemble some of the structures in the sample round program. And then, yeah, so, so the big question is, is essentially, um, there is a discussion on ensemble average, it's, which is interesting, but also uh, there is a discussion on swamp round, uh, obviously. And then the question is whether, well, they, are they compatible or if you can fit uh, everything into string theory? And I definitely don't have a final answer, uh, but, uh, but it seems that uh, in this particular example, we can discuss the, the structure in a very precise way. And um, hopefully we can extract more general lessons from what we do. Uh, thank you.